Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for A Dram of Outlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Diana Gabaldon book series to the Star is TV series and everything in between. This is The Scottish Prisoner, episode 73, week 5. Hello! It is so fabulous to be with you. And what happened in Outlander world this week is Matt Roberts is sending pictures from South Africa. Follow him on Instagram. It's No Fooling Productions. And Sam and Katrina were at Emerald City Comic Con. I'm going to watch the full length video and then do a short podcast on that alone after I finish this one. So we are in chapter nine, Eros Rising. The end of chapter eight, JB went out under parole, of course, leaving Pardlo sitting in his study. We open chapter nine with John being soaked to the bone out in the rain. For hours, he's been walking, trying to get rid of the anger he possesses toward Hal, but it's not working. He still wants to hit Hal. Obviously, he learned Jamie is in town and they are going to Ireland together. He says this is beyond Hal's usual high-handedness and, oh, how he wants to wring his neck. Jamie being at Argus House was the only thing stopping John from doing so. He couldn't blame Jamie for what's going on. He's sure Jamie doesn't like it either. And now it's hailing on him. A small group of orange-selling girls run past him. One drops an orange on the sidewalk. He picks it up, but she's already gone. The orange felt good in his hand. It's a distraction. And he was thinking he hasn't tried to strike Hal in anger since he was 15 years old. And that had not gone well. He probably could now, but Hal was still fast and a good swordsman. But nearing 40, time and campaign had taken its toll. But he could find no real point in doing it or hitting him with the orange. It wouldn't change reality. So he put the orange in his pocket. The street was flooded from the rain, and even cabbage leaves drifted underfoot. He heard his name being yelled just as a splash of dirty water came from the carriage, hitting him head to toe. He wiped dirt from his face and offal. Offal are animal entrails and internal organs. That sounds absolutely lovely, wiping that off of one's face. I can't imagine there were actually animal parts in the streets, but one never knows. <laughs> Cities were quite different than they are now. Gag. A woman peers out of the coach and laughs and says how wet he is. She's a young Scottish whore he'd met three years prior. He asks if it's her coach. He's kind of fishing for a ride. No, it isn't her coach. It's her new swell. Sent for her, or she'd offer him a ride. And he begs off with politeness. She tells him to get out of the cold or he'll get ill. Oh, and a word of advice, the new house she works at will give him a drink and warmth. And it's just down the street. He thanks her for her advice. Here's what she says back to him. Nay, charge, get on with you then, you stocious bugger, before I'm drowned. She shouted toward the coachman, and withdrawing her head promptly snapped the window shut. He leaps back, but not quite in time to miss being in the splash zone yet again as she pulls away. He thinks on her recommendation, and yes, he needs to find shelter. That's a good idea. And he's thinking the only thing worse than going to Ireland with Jamie Fraser would be doing it with a bad cold. <laughs> he wouldn't go to the brothel for a drink, though, because it would be very expensive and, well, the female attention would be foisted upon him, of course. He decides he'll go to the beefsteak, his favorite club. He could get dry clothing, a room, a hot bath, maybe. 
and a drink. So off he went the few blocks. An hour later, he was bathed, dry, had had two brandies. He's in a much better frame of mind. Yes, yes. Bringing Cyverly to justice was the most important thing. His honor was at stake for his promise to Carruthers and his duty to his country. He's done unpleasant things before, and this would just be another. And it did help knowing that Jamie would be just as uncomfortable. They would manage. And at this, he realizes he needs food. He'd missed his tea, and the brandy was hitting his empty stomach. He fixes the ill-fitting suit and goes downstairs. The club was mostly empty being early evening. Supper wasn't being served quite yet, and only one member was in the library, taking a nap. John was surprised to find Harry Corey in the writing room. He was alarmed to see Gray and covered his writing quickly. John asks if Harry is writing a new poem. What? Harry tried and failed utterly to look innocently bewildered. Poetry? Me? Letter to a lady. Oh, yes? Gray made as though to lift the blotting paper, and Quarry snatched both sheets away, pressing them to his chest. How dare you, sir, he said, with what, dignity, with what dignity he could muster. A man's private correspondence is sacred. <laughs> John's response kills me. This is how you know these books are a little different than you expect. Nothing is sacred to a man who would rhyme sanguinous and cunnilingus, I assure you. <laughs> Oh, things are getting interesting now. Jeez. And in John's head, he's blaming it on the brandy. Mm-hmm. Right, John. Harry was annoyed and jumps to his feet, readying to leave the room. I should like to see you do better. Who the devil told you? And John wonders aloud how many people know. Well, his mother had told him, but he didn't want to let Harry know that. He also said Harry gave him the book for Diderot to read. You read it? The color was beginning to come back into Harry's normally florid face. Well, no, Gray admitted. Monsieur Diderot read a number of selections from it aloud, though. He grinned involuntarily at the recollection of Monsieur Diderot, very intoxicated, declaiming poetry from Harry's anonymously published certain verses upon the subject of Eros while urinating behind a screen in Lady Jonah's salon. Hmm. So Harry gives him a narrowed eye look and exclaims, Benedicta told him. John was shocked at Harry using his mother's Christian name. Harry and Benedicta's acquaintance must have some intimacy for her to know about the poetry and for Harry to use her name. He wondered how his mother came to know Harry wrote erotic poetry. So scandalous. And Harry tries to look innocent as John stares back at him. John's description of what Harry looks like cracks me up. Harry, belatedly realizing what he'd given away, looked as innocent as it was possible for a 38-year-old colonel of expansive habit, lecherous appetite, and considerable experience to look. Gray debated briefly whether to make something of that look, but, after all, his mother was safely married now to General Stanley, and neither she nor the general would thank him for causing scandal, and he really didn't want to call Harry out anyway. Then John simply says, The lady is my mother, sir. The front door of the beefsteak opens, and it sends papers down all around John's feet. He picks them up before Harry can get to them. John reads from one. Holding Harry off, with one hand he read further. With thighs bedewed and foaming cunt. Jesus, Harry, foaming? <laughs> it's a bloody rough draft. Oh, it's rough, all right. He stepped nimbly backward into the hall, evading Harry's grasp, and collided heavily with the gentleman who had just come in. Lord John, I do beg your pardon most humbly. Are you injured? I love the way they speak to each other. There's layers of conversation going on at the same time. 
Yeah, I say that's pretty awkward, and that's a terrible rough draft. Vaginas should never, ever, ever foam. And that is my clinical thought on that. <laughs> there is something very wrong with a woman's vagina if there's foaming going on. <sighs> That's bad poetry right there. The large man who came in is von Namsen. He's a Hanoverian. He was happy to see him again. And if you want to know a lot more about Von Nampson, read the Lord John Gray series. John asks him to dine with him and describes how he looks. Life seems to be difficult for Von Nampson recently. He declines dinner, saying he's engaged, then waves at the gentleman with him, a Mr. Forbisher, and there's the usual greeting going on. Gray was going to beg off the invite, Forbisher returned to him. And during this time, Harry had reached and snatched the papers, and they found themselves going to supper with the other men after ordering more drink and food to go with supper. The dinner conversation went to poetry so John could aggravate Harry, but it ended up in a germ poem enthusiastically being recited by Forbisher, then a discussion ensued over some of the verse by Forbisher and von Nampson. They're very serious. Harry was asking his opinion, but he threw it back to Gray, saying he's not qualified to address such things. Gray also declined, but they ended up in a game of finding a rhyming word. It went something like this. They got from the simple things like moon, june, spoon, spittoon, poltroon, onto the more delicate issue of whether Poringer could be legitimately rhymed with Oranger, the latter being arguably a real word. John was sitting across from Van Nampson, and they began, and he began having rude, worded rhymes going through his head silently. Is this how Harry did it? Words just showed up in his head by themselves? He wasn't a fan of the phrasing that showed up, and it was, you cannot master me, but shall I your master be? Ha. Huh. Somebody is feeling a little bit saucy, methinks. These words had nothing to do with the relationship he had with Van Nam Von Nampson, but they did have to do with Jamie being at Argus House. And in his mind, he thinks, will you bloody go away? I'm not ready. And the food showed up just in time. He was sweating and the room felt hot. It's a Salma Gundy. So what is a Salma Gundy? It's a salad dish originating in the early 17th century in England comprising of cooked meats, seafood, vegetables, fruit, leaves, nuts, and flowers, and it's all dressed with oil, vinegar, and spices. There is some debate over the meaning and origin of the word. The French word Salma Gundy means a hodgepodge or mix of widely disparate things. There's your vocabulary lesson for the day and food lesson. And I love the use of the word kerfuffle to describe the scene change. So we have all these things being set up. We've seen Harry Quarry a few times. Now we have Von Nampson being introduced. And this book is the gateway, obviously, to the Lord John Gray books. So keep your eye on some of this. Harry asks what brings von Namsen to London, and his face grew dark. Forbisher said he's buying properties for the captain. There's papers to sign. Von Namsen offers more explanation. His wife had died. He's brought his children to his sister who lives in London. Harry offers his sympathies, and suddenly von Namsen gets to his feet and leaves the room with what sounds like a sob. Forbisher had no idea he'd felt it so deeply. Neither had Gray, and they resumed eating after an awkward silence, and Forbisher had nothing to add about the loss, so they talked politics, of all things. The Gray simply made the appropriate noisy responses as he sat and pondered Stephen von Namsen. He spared a thought for Louise von Lowenstein, the Saxon princess, who'd married Stephen three years prior. God rest her soul, but his thoughts were really for Stephen. John thought the marriage had been of mutual convenience and that Stephen's tastes were, well, different. 
He and Stephen had feelings for each other, he thought, though there was never an outright declaration. So John is thinking all this through, and he's recalling an evening. They were in Germany when he had helped Stephen to remove his shirt outdoors, had examined and kissed the stump of his recently amputated left arm, and how the man's skin had glowed in the magic of the dusky light. His face grew hot, and he bent his head over his plate. Still, Stephen might have been sincerely attached to Louisa, no matter what the true nature of their marriage had been. And there were men who enjoyed the physical attractions of both sexes. For that matter, Gray himself knew several women whose deaths would distress him greatly, though he had no relation with them beyond that of friendship. Von Namsen is now returned, and he looks restored, and they discussed racing over port and brandy. While they were waiting for their cloaks, John asked if he could see Von Namsen home. He agreed. He would appreciate his company. And he made sure, though, that Forbisher and Harry weren't paying attention to this conversation. Von Namsen and John did not speak during the coach ride. The rain had stopped and the windows were down. Fresh air. John was acutely aware of Von Namsen's large presence, his knee an inch from John's. As he followed Von Namsen out of the coach, he caught a whiff of his spicy cologne. It reminded him of cloves and oranges at Christmas. His hand closed around the orange in his pocket as he thought of other rounded things that might fit into his palm. He is feeling saucy. Then he chides himself. After dismissing his very tired butler, they went into the sitting room where Stephen stirred the fire embers back to life. They shared a drink, and John notices the bottles were mostly half empty. How long had Stephen been in London? Stephen thanked him for the company. He hadn't wanted to be alone this night. John is sorry it took such a loss to bring them back together again and asks if he misses his wife greatly. He does. She was a good manager, but it's his children he has the sorrow for. She's been a kind stepmother to them, and they loved her. They'd lost their own mother when they were quite small. His stepson must stay in Lowenstein as the heir... And that's another loss for his children. He had left them with his sister just this afternoon. And Stephen was quite sad. Or you could say Stefan. I'm not sure which pronunciation it is, so I'm going with Stephen. Gray talks about his cousin's young son, Cromwell, remembering his birth, and then of his stepbrother, Percy, who had been his lover at the time. Memories are a mess for him, just like they are for Jamie. John shares being at the birth, and Stephen laughs. And there's a description of the house I think is important. The house was quiet, and the small room seemed removed from everything. A warm refuge in the depths of the night. He felt as though the two of them were castaways, thrown up together on some island by the storms of life, passing uncharted time by exchanging their stories. Literarily, I'm not sure what to make of that description but I think it really grounds the scene and gives the idea of how John feels. Battered, in unknown circumstances that he has to navigate, and here he is amongst an old friend. And John remembers being tended to at Stephen's hunting lodge after being wounded once. Stephen picks up on his thoughts and asks if he is well, if the wounds still pain him. John says no, knowing that non-physical wounds still pain him. And John asks, Und dein Arm? Stephen laughs and lifts the stump. Nein, ein unanem Likkeit meier nicht. A nuisance, no more. They talked in both languages, and John watches Stephen intently as the light played upon his face and his emotions changed. John thinks he shouldn't have been surprised at the depth of the man's feelings toward his children, knowing how mercurial and passionate he is. Passion, he supposed you'd call it. Weirdly enough, it reminded him of the Scots, who were emotionally much the same, though less disciplined about it. And that phrase was coming back in an iteration, Master me, or shall I your master be? His attraction to Stephen merged with all the things Jamie Fraser. He was flushed and discomfited. 
Did he want Stephen because of his similarities to Fraser, both big men, tall, commanding, the sort that made people turn to look at them? And to look at either of them stirred him deeply. Stephen was a good friend, and Fraser never could be. And Fraser was something Stephen could never be. Well, I guess we know John's type. Because <laughs> he's only a little bigger than Claire in the books. He's a slight, pretty, handsome man. Stephen goes through his cupboards, and he pulls out some jam and biscuits. John smiles, remembering his early assertion about Stephen's appetite. He watched him devour the biscuits. And John is wondering about what type of closeness they have. Stephen had touched his hand while reaching for a biscuit, squeezing it before letting go, and sensation ran through John's body. I wonder if he's really transparent when he's interested. Does he have a good poker face? I don't know. John thought no. He's struggling for logic, for decency. I can't. It wouldn't be right. Not right to you, Stephen, to try to slake his physical need with Stephen, perhaps risk their friendship by trying. And yet the temptation was there. No doubt of that either. Not only the immediate desire, which was bloody strong, but the ignoble thought that he might, by such means, exercise or at least temper the hold Fraser had upon him. It would be far easier to face Fraser, to deal with him calmly if the sense of physical desire was at least muted, if not gone, entirely. John is a decent and good man. He gets up to leave, and well. Stephen grabs him close, and there's kissing going on and other things. Diana knows how to write sex scenes very well. John asks Stephen what he's thinking, and Stephen smiled, running his fingers down John's shoulder to his wrist. He has a very German response. I'm wondering, what is the risk that I will die before St. Catherine's Day? What? Why? And when is St. Catherine's Day? In three weeks. That is when Father Gehring returns from Salzburg. Oh, yes? Stephen let go of his wrist and opened his eyes. If I go back to Hanover and confess this to Father Fenstermacher, I will probably have to hear Mass every day for a year or undertake a pilgrimage to Trier. Father Gehring is somewhat less exacting. I see, and if you die before making your confession, I will go to hell, of course, Stephen said matter-of-factly, but I think it's worth the risk. It's a long walk to Trier. He coughs and clears his throat. <laughs> He's hoping to confess his sins to a priest that is less exacting. Then the conversation turns and he says to John, that what you did to me? And a rosy glow goes across his cheekbones. I did a lot of things to you, Stephen. Which one? This one? He kissed von Namsen's mouth. Stephen kissed a lot of men in the German way, but not like this. John describes how good it feels to have the powerful flesh melt slowly as his mouth softened, yielding to him. Who doesn't love that response in a kiss? Stephen sighs, telling John he wants to give him pleasure. And what would he like? It's so German of him. And tell me, what would you like? <laughs> Gray was speechless, pondering the question, and all it summoned. What would he like? Everything, Stephen, anything. It, I mean, to touch you, just to watch you gives me pleasure. Ooh. He tells Gray he can watch, but asks if he can touch him. Oh, yes. Nothing like a direct invitation. And he wants to know how best to touch Gray. How? But Gray can no longer think clearly because his cock is in Stephen's hand. Then they go over the nuts and bolts of it, oral sex, anal sex, all the what's. Stephen, obviously, has little experience with men, though he has interest. And John cannot look away from Stephen's nicely endowed member. 
more logistics and worries. And well, John doesn't normally like being the bottom and he yells, Oh Jesus. In anticipation, (laughs) he likes to be on top. He doesn't like to be a bottom, but he's working it through in his mind. Stephen works to calm him and he addresses him well And John thinks, yes, Stephen's a horseman and a breeder of dogs. He was stroking John's hair, and Stephen knew what slowly meant. What he didn't say here was, just like Jamie knew his animals and how to calm someone, but Jamie would never do this with him. There's not a chance. I think this scene was handled very well. It's not in a disturbed or critical way. John has needs, too. He does get his needs met here and elsewhere, but he doesn't really fall in love with anyone else. Only Jamie. And I contend that he still uses his fascination with Jamie to stay away from being too close to anyone else. Yes, there's the issue of getting caught, but there's an underground homosexual community. It's not like he can't find lovers. He does. But he never lets anyone get that close to him. Commit to someone on an emotional level as well as a physical level. I mean, he can't really be in love with Jamie. He doesn't know him. Not really. There's so much of him that he keeps away. And it reminds me of another character who, in a much later book, is hopelessly in love with Claire. But Jamie points out he can't really be in love with her. He doesn't fully know her like Jamie does. He doesn't have the privilege of being in that inner sanctum. And though John and Jamie had been close and they worked on a friendship, there's so much that's kept hidden away It's the idea of Jamie that he loves. But to me, it just reminds me of some type of smoke and mirrors that Jamie is out in this place that makes nobody else be able to get in. And maybe it's for John's safety. Maybe not. I'm not sure. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. It confounds me that the depth of how John feels for him. And maybe it's just because it's unrequited and he has no opportunity to really explore it with Jamie. But I don't know. I can see having a lifelong attraction to somebody, but to be so in love with them that it interferes with life relationships on some level. There's more to it in my mind. Chapter 10, Punch and Judy. It's the next day now, and Jamie seems to be having an outright panic attack. He's walking and counting and can't get a good breath drawn. He thinks of Claire being with Rabbi McNabb after he'd fallen from the hayloft. She'd spoken to him, calming him while looking for broken bones, and she told him how to breathe. Jamie caught the rhythm from the memory and began to ease into normal breathing himself. What was wrong with him? Well, earlier, the Duke had summoned him, and he walked into the drawing room, coming face to face with Colonel Quarry. And he was looking the same as he had when he last saw him at Ardsmuir. Remember, he was the governor prior to John. He turned and walked out of the house into the park. He was getting hot and cold. He wiped his sweating palms on his mended brakes. He wasn't fearful of Quarry, but seeing him standing there made his belly grip and spots swim before his eyes. He had, he had to leave or faint right there on the hearth rug. He found a tree to sit and lean against, but he kept feeling the fetters about his wrists. Quarry had placed them upon him when he was at Ardsmere. That's something we saw even years later when he was recounting to Claire. In certain circumstances, he could still feel those chains upon him. 
and one of the Argus House footmen followed him discreetly. He was only being watched like the night before when he went to walk off his anger. He thought about getting up and running, and should have, because when he stood up, Tobias Quinn popped out of the bushes. Well, the description was slithering out of a bush like a toad. <laughs> but I thought toad topped. I don't know. Well, and there's luck for you, Quinn remarked, looking pleased. I thought I should have to lurk about for days and hear himself walk straight up to me and to me not at the watching for more than half a day. Didn't a bloody call me himself, Jamie said irritably. What the devil are you doing here? And why are you hiding in a bush wearing that? <laughs> he was wearing a black and pink checked coat and it was quite the attention grabber. Quinn says he expected a different greeting from a friend, and he wasn't hiding, but saw him and was making his way quickly in case he fled. As for his plumage, it is not the fine thing of the world, he says. He tells Quinn to go away, but the Irishman follows. The footman was absorbed in an argument between two coachmen. Quinn then shows him how the coat could be worn either side out, and the inside was a sober black wool. He put it back on and took off his wig, and now he was looking more like a lawyer or a Quaker. Jamie tells him he's no the man for your job. He tells Jamie he'll have him in Ireland by the end of the week, and Jamie realizes Quinn is telling him they should abscond right now. Abscond. What a fantastic word. I kind of do that. Quinn wants to know why not. He points out the footman who's watching after him, and Quinn argues he's not watching him right now. He's feisty. Jamie refuses to go with him. I've told you once, and I'll say it again. I'll have nothing to do with any such crack brain notion. The cause is dead, and I've no intent to follow it into the grave. I... Quinn affected not to have heard this, instead looking thoughtfully at Argus House. Quinn says, that's the Duke of Pardlow's house. Why did the soldiers bring you here, I wonder? Jamie says the soldiers didn't tell him, which is true, but of course now he knows why. Quinn says he shouldn't wait to find out knowing the English. And Jamie, not wanting Quinn to get in trouble, tells him to leave. It's dangerous. And Quinn wonders why they took him by soldier from Hellwater, but allow him to wander outside. Jamie says he has no idea why and wishes the footman would turn around. Jamie walks off, and Quinn follows behind him, and Jamie knows if the footman turns around, he would come looking, and he'd welcome the disruption. Quinn wouldn't stop yapping, though, and Jamie hardly heard what he was saying. He cleverly made his way for a crowd to shut Quinn up until he could figure out how to get rid of him. He's thinking about these terrible dreams he's been having, and he had one last night. And that's why seeing Quarry made him feel faint. Chains, he thought, and knew that if he lingered on that thought for more than an instant, he'd find himself in the dream again, sweating and ill, crouched against a stone wall, unable to lift his hand to wipe the vomit from his beard, the fetters too heavy, the metal hot from his fever, inescapable, eternal captivity. No, he said fiercely, and turned abruptly off the path, coming to a halt in front of a puppet show. Anything to fill his senses to keep the clank of chains at bay. Jamie has quite a bit of PTSD. I don't know what it would be called back then. It's gone through many iterations of naming over the decades. It was first really looked at after World War I, and it was called Shell Shock. And it's something that has been deeply investigated since early last century. He was ignoring Quinn, and he pretended to watch the play. He'd seen such a thing in Paris. He was breathing normally again now. The ordinary sense of the day closed in around him like warm water. There's another water reference. John thought he was on an island. Punchinello was the name of the man puppet, and Judy was his wife. The crowd shrieked in delight at the play, and Jamie thinks Willie would like it. And he's thinking he can get rid of Quinn, but Pardlow was another matter. 
He could force him to go to Ireland, but without the possibility of lifelong imprisonment coming from it. He could finish the job and go back to Hellwater, to the boy, and he would go back to Hellwater. He missed him. He was wishing he had Willie up on his shoulders right now. Would Willie remember him if he was gone for months? He'd have to find Cy really quickly so he could go back to Hellwater. He could feel the child's imagined weight on his shoulders, warm and heavy, smelling faintly of wee and strawberry jam. There were some chains you wore because you wanted to. Mm. It's true. There are chains that each of us choose. John is back at Argus house, and Hal asks him where he's been and what happened to his clothes. These were his dried clothes that had been soaked, but they were still a mess. He said he'd been soaked through, then stayed with a friend for the night. He was in good spirits. Nothing could change that. Where's our guest? He tells him he's sitting under a tree at the park and has no idea why. And Hal explains that Harry Quarry came for tea. I was expecting you to be here, by the way, Hal gave him an eyeball, which he ignored. And when Fraser came in, he looked, he took one look at Harry and walked straight out of the house without a by your leave. I only know where he is because I told one of the footmen to follow him if he went out. He'll like that, I'm sure, Gray said. For God's sake, Hal, Harry was a governor at Ardsmere before me. Surely you knew that. Hal looked irritably blank. Possibly so. He put Fraser in irons for 18 months and left him that way when he came back to London. Oh, Hal considered that frowning. I see. How was I meant to know that, for heaven's sake? Well, you could have. If you had the common sense to tell me what the devil you were doing rather than, Oh, hello, Harry. Didn't know you were still here. <laughs> So Hal had no idea, and John thinks Jamie left because Corey was an insult to him. Hal finally gets it. He says he didn't know Corey had a history with Jamie. That's one way of putting it for sure. John is glad he wasn't there on time to have Jamie see both he and Corey together there. No, it would have been a bad scene. And Hal explains why Harry is there. He has knowledge of Cyverly and Ireland. Then Harry says, I'd best go and talk to him, hadn't I? And say what exactly, Gray asked, out of sheer inability to imagine what could be said in the circumstances. Harry shrugged. Offer him satisfaction if he likes. Don't see that there's much else to be done. Offer him satisfaction. Let him punch him in the face. Do some kind of bodily harm. The Gray brothers exchanged a look of perfect comprehension and suppressed horror. The implication of a duel between a regimental colonel and a paroled prisoner in the custody of the colonel of the regiment, putting aside the complete illegality of the proceedings and the very real possibility that one of them might, well, kill or maim the other. Harry, Hal began, but John interrupted him. John says he'll be his second, if it's necessary. And he goes to run out to inquire about arrangements. So John is taking a bull by the horns here. What a mess in the making. So it goes from Jamie coming in, seeing Corey, freaking out and leaving to control himself. And now Harry is like offering a duel. Oh my. And John notices that due to the excellent weather today, the park is full of people and he can't see Jamie right away. John thought what was best to do and decided to go into the park to find Jamie. And this way, Hal or Harry couldn't interfere. And he thought he could easily find Jamie in the crowd if he was standing up. He decides to veer toward the puppet show. That was a good call because he sees Jamie absorbed in the show. He hopes Jamie's mood would be good after watching the entertainment, but since Judy was beating Punch into a cocked hat, maybe it's not so calming after all. He would love to see Jamie do that same thing to Hal, but there might be consequences. John is still angry at Hal. He watched Jamie and the show. 
it gave him unexpected pleasure to see Fraser smile. He leaned on a tree, feeling anonymous, and liking it. He was glad to see Jamie was okay after that episode in the stable at Hellwater. He was relieved he could put it behind him, though not forget it. He saw Jamie lean and listen to a curly-haired man next to him. And this brings Percy again to the surface, but John shoves that thought right away. John has his own memories and demons to manage. He hadn't thought about what he would say or how he would start a conversation, but the play ended and he hurried onto the path slightly in front of Jamie. He wanted Jamie to make the first move since he would notice him in front of him. He heard Jamie snort, a Scottish noise. Good afternoon, Colonel. Good afternoon, Captain Fraser. Did you enjoy the show? I thought I'd gauge how long my chain is within sight of the house, is it? For the moment, but I did not come to retrieve you. I have a message from Colonel Quarry. Oh, I? John says he wishes to offer Jamie satisfaction. What? John goes on. He's offering to fight a duel with me. Is that what you're saying? Jamie is stunned. Would Hal allow such a thing to happen? It's quite comical. All Jamie can say for a moment is, Jesus, God. Quarry cannot think you'd let me. You and his grace, I mean. Gray's heart gave a slight jerk. Christ, he was thinking about it. Seriously. I personally have nothing to say regarding the matter. As for my brother, nothing to me was indicated he would interfere. Fraser made a thoroughly scotch sort of noise in his throat, not quite a growl, but it lifted the hairs on Gray's neck, and for the first time he began to worry that Fraser just might send back a challenge. He hadn't thought. Well, he thought Fraser would be startled by the notion, but then he swallowed and blurted, Should you wish to call him out, I will second you. Jamie was more shocked at what Gray said than the offer of a duel from Quarry. Jamie eyes Gray closely. Gray's heart was hammering so hard it was painful. Jamie's hands were curled into fists, and John remembered how Jamie almost smashed his face at their last meeting with one of those fists. And John asked if Jamie's ever fought a duel. Yes. John could see Jamie's mind working quickly. And when it's done, he softens and asks why Corey wants to give him satisfaction. John thinks his sense of honor demands it. Jamie says something under his breath in Erse, John thinks, Gaelic. And Jamie wants to know why John made the offer to second him. Do you dislike Quarry? No, he's one of John's best friends. And John explains he can second them both. I see. So was I to kill him, you'd oblige to fight me. And if he killed me, you'd fight him? And should we kill each other, what then? I suppose I'd call a surgeon to dispose of your bodies and then commit suicide, Gray said a little testily. But let us not be rhetorical. You have no intent of calling him out, do you? I'll admit the prospect has its attractions, but you may tell Colonel Quarry I decline his offer. Even, I love that it holds attractions. John says Jamie can decline himself because Quarry is still at the house. Or Jamie stops dead in his tracks. Looking at Gray, like a large cat, regarding how edible a smaller creature is. Gray says if he chooses not to meet him, then stay here for another 15 minutes. Jamie responds almost violently. I let the gobshite think I'm afraid of him. Damn you, Englishman. Dare you to suggest such a thing? Were I to call someone out, it would be you. And you know it. Jamie walks toward the house with purpose. The door opens before he reaches the top step. Jamie wants desperately to smash his fist through something, but he didn't because punching the walnut paneling would hurt, and it would be futile anyway. And he didn't mean to meet Quarry dripping of blood. He almost trod on the Duchess in the hallway. He apologizes and bows. She calls him Captain Fraser. Christ, you too? Why have you all begun 
Call me Captain Fraser. You weren't yesterday. Did his grace tell you to? No, she had actually suggested it, or would he rather be called Brock Turok? Isn't that his proper title? It used to be a thousand years ago, he said. Mr. Fraser will do. She put her hand on him as he was setting to leave. She wants to talk to him, and he remembers her? Also, a thousand years ago, and he has business with Colonel Quarry just now. I'll find you, she says. The interruption calmed him further. He had a good sense of self when he enters the room. The men turned and looked at him. Quarry was wary but unafraid. Jamie walked up to Pardlow close enough. Pardlow had to look up at him, and he apologized for leaving so suddenly earlier. He needed air. He bowed toward Quarry. Oh, it's testosterone on parade. He felt Pardlow look past him and knew John had entered the room as well. Pardlow suggested they all sit and asked John to tell Pilcock they needed brandy. They discussed wanting to bring Cyverly to court-martial instead of lawsuit and all the whys. And they think, if it's a regular lawsuit, he has enough money and can counter-sue. At court-martial, he can't do that. Then they go over the legalities and procedures. And if he's guilty at a court-martial, you could, I suppose, have him shot? Jamie's question startles the other three as he'd been silent this whole time. Hal says... He would likely be hanged. Shooting is for mutiny or desertion. Corey considers if they want Cyverly dead or not. John thinks on it and he doesn't want him dead. Nor does he want part in considering it. Cyverly had saved his life before. Another vocabulary word of the day is pusillanimous. It means cowardly. Hal says it's better to have him imprisoned cashiered and imprisoned. I guess take his money, find. And Jamie has some amusing thoughts. And here I thought it was a mercy you offered when you declined to shoot me, Fraser said to Hal. A debt of honor, did you say? He lifted his glass, ironical. A deep flush rose in Hal's face. Gray didn't think he'd ever seen his brother at a total loss for words before. Hal looked at Fraser for several moments and finally nodded. Touché, Captain Fraser. Court-martial it is, then. Harry and I will start the business here, while you and the captain go to retrieve Major Cyverly. Now, Harry, who do you know in Ireland who might be of help? And the chapter closes. <laughs> Jamie has a way of completely disarming people conversationally. He sits back, and now he's getting into his groove where before he seemed so discombobulated and didn't quite know where he fit or what to do and was acting remarkably like Claire would in assumption and how processing and sort of being a bull in a china shop. Now he's finding his zone, right? He had to pick his path because with Quinn, he could have left immediately, but he would always have a price on his head. There could never be any thought of freedom, and he would be a traitor again. So, it's a dance that's going on between all of them, and we'll see where it takes us. What were your thoughts on that sex scene between Von Namsen and John? Did it surprise you? There's undoubtedly much adventure ahead. I received the most lovely email from Jan. She is a retired music teacher, wife and mama, and she's in South Central Pennsylvania after living for 35 years on Long Island, New York. Thank you, Jan, for your uplifting letter to me. It's very meaningful to get feedback and to find out what my time and investment in this podcast means to all of you. I I will admittedly say it's interesting and odd to know that I'm part of your weekly life and I'm like a friend who comes alongside you to talk Outlander in some capacity and that you take me with you into your tasks 
and that she appreciates my thoughtfulness and how real I am and the insights that I have. And honestly, a lot of this I'm learning right along with you guys because though I've read the material over and over, I've never stopped and looked at it with such a critical eye, looked at every sentence and the structure and where there could be hidden meanings and when there's foreshadowing. I normally didn't do that because just like many of you, I read the books and I see all the things that I like to see. All my favorite things bubble to the surface where things that I'm not as interested in may not jump out at me and don't tell the full breadth of the story. And going through the books this way, a couple chapters at a time, really elevates the experience. And for me, it gives me questions along the way to answer. Who, what, when, why, how? <laughs> Where is it going? And it's that inner three-year-old that wants to further examine and investigate. So, Jan, thank you so much for your letter of appreciation and it means the world to me to get this feedback from you guys. It really does. I sit behind a microphone and I have pages and pages of notes. And knowing that it's bringing some kind of joy and thought into somebody else's world is such great reward. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So where do you find A Dram of Outlander outside the podcast? Well, Facebook, it's A Dram of Outlander page. There's also a private group that's just for listeners that I started recently working on it. And on Twitter and Instagram, it's Dram of Outlander. On Wednesday nights, there is a Twitter chat every week under the hashtag ADOO for A Dram of Outlander. And even if you don't know how to use Twitter, you type in the hashtag, you click on it, and you can see the conversation that's going on um, from everybody who's participating. And what we do every Wednesday is go over the prior podcast and we break it down and people give their own insights and ask questions. And it's a lot of fun. Sometimes it gets a little cheeky and saucy itself. And every once in a while, somebody might pop in unexpectedly, like uh, one of the writers that wrote an episode for season two popped up and joined our conversation not that long ago, which is really fun. And so I do want to hear from you. Please send me a message through any social media. You can also leave a voicemail at 719-425-9444. It's the listener line. You can send an email to adramofoutlander at gmail.com. You can always leave comments on any of the social media places as well. How do you support the podcast? Well, you can go to iTunes and leave a review. You can share it. Please share it with other people. Um, those you know who listen to Outlander. There's now 70 some episodes that people can listen to. And there's all the things I've written on the website as well. And that's a dram of outlander.com. <laughs> you can financially support the podcast through patreon.com slash a dram of outlander. It can be a small monthly donation, or you can send a one time uh, donation to me, which others have done. And I appreciate it. Very, very much. So next week, we are doing the next two chapters, 11 and 12. And I'm hoping this takes us into June, so it will give us lots of time to get to know this side of Jamie and John and Hal and others. So I hope you have a fantastic week. And until next time, slanjava.